Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate. I am a nurse educator here at Women's Health Network, and I'm so glad you're here to join us today for a discussion on alkaline diet, um, which comes up a lot around here. It's really big in bone health, but also a lot of other um, health areas. So I'm so glad that you're here. Um, joining me today in the discussion are um, clinical nutritionist and uh, medical anthropologist specializing in bone health, um, Dr. Susan Brown. She's joining us from New York. Hi, Susan. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. And we also have today Dr. Sharon Stills. She's a naturopathic MD, and she is joining us from Arizona. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so thank you both for being here. Um, why don't we just get started? Some people have not even heard of an alkaline diet before. Um, Susan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it means to, to maintain an alkaline diet? Well, really, it's very fascinating when you look around the world at diet programs and you look at the human physiology, you see that we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to adjust to a certain sort of diet. And that diet was a very a diet very high in potassium, calcium, magnesium, all these minerals. Largely, what we're thinking about is the minerals from fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, bark, grubs, all those things we ate. Um, that actually those minerals were attached to alkalizing compounds like carbonates, citrates, and ascorbates. So in the body, there evolved this delicate dance of maintaining a pH balance. Um, just like we know their soils get damaged and the waters get damaged if they're too acid, the human body can get too acid. And we largely get too acid because we produce, we produce many acids. As we breathe, we produce acid, but we exhale carbon dioxide, which is actually carbonic acid. And so we always are maintaining, producing a lot of acids, excreting a lot of acids, and we stay in nice balance. In fact, if you have a, a medical emergency, uh, they will measure your pH and they'll try to make sure that that blood is right because if it's not, if it isn't very precise, just slightly alkaline, you're going to die quickly. And so the body does an awful lot to keep pH in balance. And however, amongst all of nature's wisdom, there is one area where acids can accumulate, where the body doesn't automatically excrete them, and that relates to diet. Since we evolved with lots of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, our chemistry is such and our kidney functioning is such that we need all of these alkalizing compounds to stay in balance. We have certain foods that leave an acid residue. And by the way, for the people that are chemically inclined, acid is simply free hydrogen. So they leave free hydrogen ions. And other foods that can actually buff, leave a, uh, a compound that can buffer those hydrogen ions. So with our diet, we want to stay in balance, not too much acid-forming food, um, because when we're too acid, the body simply says, red alert, emergency, we have got to take alkalizing mineral compounds out of the tissues, out of the cells, out of the bone to maintain that pH, which, is, which you can only live a few minutes if it isn't balanced. So the diet is a little wiggle room where we can actually get too acid and the body won't correct it unless we take more alkalizing compounds in the form of foods or in the form of supplements. So an alkaline diet is a diet that provides lots of foods that leave an acid uh, component when they're metabolized. And those are largely vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, spices. Those are all very alkalizing. Acid-forming foods are foods largely that have sulfur-containing amino acids that when you burn them up, they leave a sulfuric acid, just like acid rain when we burn hydrocarbons in the environment. So we can produce our own internal acidity with certainly coffee, sugar, alcohol, these extraneous kind of things we take in on these days. That's the balance, alkalizing forming foods, acid forming foods. Okay, so diet is obviously really important. We've all heard, you know, that we need a certain number of fruits and vegetables, a certain number of servings. I know with the alkaline diet, a lot of the recommendations are way higher than we hear. It's way more than five servings a day. You know, we're talking, you know, nine, 11, 13 servings yes, exactly. of fruits and vegetables. But um, 
So we're going to come back to those foods in just a moment, but um, what are there any factors aside from diet that contribute to pH balance within the body? Um, Sharon? Absolutely. We have to think of the body as a whole and our experiences as a whole. So simply your thoughts can make you acidic. What you're thinking if you wake up and you're in a negative mood or you're forgetting to be grateful and you don't get your happy on, then you can be creating acidity in your body as well as lymphatic stagnation, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi. So if the body is not in a healthy state and the organisms are not in balance, you're going to be in an acidic state as well. So it's really quite holistic and kind, quite comprehensive as to how we remain in an alkaline state. And of course, what Susan said, the diet is a fantastic basis and one we want to take into account but just like everything else in our lives we can't just isolate and be looking down a tunnel we have to look at the whole thing so how we get up how we breathe how we think how we move it all contributes to whether we're going to be alkaline or acid yes yeah, certainly breathing is very important and we often don't realize that allergies immune responses when a, when a white blood cell goes to destroy that particle that's gotten in the blood they create acids to destroy that particle so allergies alone can cause a lot of um, a lot of a lot of acidity as well as worry. They've noticed when a, they the researchers suggest that if you have a fight with your the person you're living with, you'll probably excrete calcium in the urine and lose uh, lose buffering compounds. So, like Sharon says, all the emotional aspects, allergies, they're all important. So there are a lot of in addition to maintaining the diet, there are a lot of things that we can be doing to make sure that we're as alkaline as we're capable of being. Yeah, yeah, you keep that balance. But you know, and another thing we forget is that with aging, our kidneys become weaker. And as they become weaker, we don't produce so much bicarbonate. And the real trick with pH balance is bicarbonate versus free hydrogen. And actually, all the foods that we eat that are high in like potassium citrate or ascorbates, they're all converted into bicarbonate in the body. So chemistry, you want that kidney recycling bicarbonate, producing bicarbonate, but the kidney gets older, it gets weaker. So another good reason to take care of your whole body, and certainly diet makes it worse, stress makes it worse, but it's also an aging factor. That's why we have to pay more attention to our pH as we age because we're going to get acid, and we need to work to combat that if we want to have strong muscles and strong bone. Okay. So... What are um, what are some of the things that everybody can start doing today to create a more alkaline state? Um, we, we know increasing those fruits and vegetables, cutting out on those um, acid-forming foods, a lot of the, the meats and you know, sugar, coffee, the things that you mentioned there um, a few minutes ago, Susan. What should we all start, if I want to start today to make myself more alkaline? What would be your, your best recommendations? Yeah, it would be fun to get, to get Sharon's take and my take. Certainly, the book I wrote is The Acid Alkaline Food Guide. It's really been translated into many languages. It's a very interesting guide that tells you each food, how much it adds to the acid load or how much it adds to the alkaline load. This is a lot of fun, and it has the basic, uh, the basic discussion of why pH is important. A little bit about the science. It's a great book. And one of the things you'll see from here is that we suggest Start right out with 13 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Now, like you mentioned, that's a little tough. Um, I have to tell you, if you did that, though, you'd only get the RDA for potassium. In other words, most of the alkalizing compounds are attached to potassium in the body um, and their citrates, and it's, it's, it reflects that environment we evolved in where we just ate lots of... Uh, uh, the, lots of the fruits and grasses and, you know, and some meat at times, but... Other times we really depended on the vegetables. So anyway, now recent researchers, and I was just meeting with them at some meet in Montreal, suggested that maybe only eight servings of fruits and vegetables would be enough. Eight half cup servings. So there you go. That's not so tough. So I tell everyone, we always say, start out with two cups of vegetables for lunch and dinner. That's probably the very major change for most Americans. I would say that's my number one guideline. Sharon, what's your number one guideline? Oh gosh, do I have to pick just one? <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I definitely agree. Susan is definitely quite an authority on this, so 
Um, definitely getting your veggies in. I would say, you know, don't forget you can put fruits and veggies, especially veggies, in with your breakfast. So don't just think of them for lunch and dinner. Uh, make sure that you're breathing or doing some kind yeah. of pranayama or some kind of breath work so that you're oxygenating your body and excreting the carbon dioxide. I think having a gratitude journal helps on the emotional um, part of things so you can really be embracing and calling happiness into you and really putting it into your cells. I think that um, one of the things I recommend is that you make sure you're digesting properly and so sometimes this goes a little opposite of what you would think but sometimes I actually have patients take hydrochloric acid. You want to make sure that you're digesting properly and if your stomach isn't acidic enough, if you don't have the proper hydrochloric acid, then you're not going to acidify the food that you're eating and it's that acidic bolus that goes into the small intestine that's going to actually trigger the excretion of pancreatic enzymes and cholecystokinin from the gallbladder. So we are supposed to be alkaline and Susan explained it properly, the whole science of it. You know, she did a beautiful job with that. But there are parts of our body that actually should be acidic to make us alkaline and the stomach is one of those areas. And so if you're having a lot of bloating after meals or a lot of belching, it might want to be something you explore with your physician about whether you have enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach or not. You know, that's a really important point that certainly the body is very complex and parts of it, like the stomach, you want to be acid and it's very important so that you can digest those minerals, liberate the compounds, even the citrates and the carbonates, the alkalizing compounds. So that's a really good point. And the other point that Sharon makes that's terrific is breathing. I mean, we actually bring oxygen into the system and that's very alkalizing. So to practice breathing exercises, that's really a very good idea too. Although we emphasize diet here at the Center for Better Bones, the breathing very important, the stress reduction, the digestion. Yeah, I have to, I have to say in my practice, when I see a patient, I do their intake. It's a very long intake, it could be an hour or more. And typically after that, then I'm studying the patient's case and coming up with a plan of what I want to do. And the one thing that I often do for patients is when I do their intake and then till I see them again in a week or two or whatever it is, I send them home with some alkalinizing agents. Um, and it's amazing to see just by getting them alkaline, just by starting to shift that, a lot of times when they come back in two weeks, a lot of their initial complaints are gone or extremely subsided. And so it really goes to show the importance of getting the body alkaline. That can set the baseline. In fact, it's so important uh, at the Center for Better Bones that we actually produce this little pH test kit that has my book and has pH paper, and has a, even has sample menus. So people can really, like, in our work, they don't have to always come here. They can just simply work with their pH and get it all set up. And like you say, sometimes many of the problems resolve right there. But let me let me just say one other thing too. Many people misunderstand my work and they suggest you should really have a low protein diet. I'm really not suggesting that. You know that protein is very important for bones, important for muscles. And so you know the new research is saying you know 70, 80, maybe. You know, the protein more than we expect, at least one gram per every kilogram of weight. And so it's not that we eat less protein, but we eat more alkalizing compounds, more the fruits, vegetables, less than seeds, um, and or take alkalizing components, alkalizing minerals if we need to do that. And the minerals we produce, like the Better Bones Builder, is really totally alkalizing. I rarely see a person that doesn't alkalize on that because we made it to be an alkalizing multivitamin formula focused on bone. So yeah, don't, not that we're neglecting protein, but we're trying to create a new balance and it's all of that, maybe the food additives, the processed foods, the sodas, the excess coffee, this kind of tips the scale towards acidity away from the use of real solid alkalizing and also foods. Well, and it's important too, I think, to um, for people to understand their, that a, um, there are other protein sources. You don't have to have a steak right. for dinner. You know, there are plenty of alkalizing protein sources in the beans and seeds and, and nuts. And, yeah, um, they aren't exactly alkalizing. They're, all protein is a little bit acid forming because of the sulfur containing amino acids that when they're, they produce like a sulfuric acid. But that's okay because the, any protein you use is not going to be acid forming. It's only like excess. Well, and I think Susan's kit 
is wonderful because I, I love that. I love, I usually have patients go pick up some pH paper, but that way you are involved and you can start seeing how your body reacts because I think there's a lot of metabolic individuality and we're also, according to the season and according to our Ayurvedic dosha, and so when you're using the pH paper, you really get to see, wow, this really made me acidic, you know, oh, this doesn't make me as acidic, and so, you know, the important thing is to get in touch with your body and what you're eating and how you feel. Do a food journal when you're eating things. See, you know, sometimes you eat something and you can say, wow, I feel a little stressed or a little anxious after that, or I ate this and I feel really relaxed, and typically when we feel really relaxed, we're going to be more in an alkaline state. Right, right, right. That's such a great idea because people can see the change. They'll start out, they'll start out acid. The vast majority, and it's fun to do with your family because you everyone, <laughs> everyone does a little, a little first morning urine sample, and they say, "Wow, we're all acid," and yet they start changing their diet. They see they feel better, and they can see the pH change right, right in the first morning urine. Yeah, and that's a good point. Just speaking of that, um, just so everybody knows, if you're not familiar with um, checking pH. Um, it's very simple. It's not a matter of all kinds of blood testing. You get little strips that um, just test the, like Sharon said, the, or like both of you said, the first morning urine or the saliva if you, you know, get up to, to void frequently during the night. But um, it, it's very easy and very inexpensive to, to, uh, to keep track of. So, um, yeah, so that's something that, that we could all definitely do. Um, when people are stuck, you know, we speak with a lot of women who are checking their pH and um, feel like they just, even though they're eating their vegetables and they're um, working on their stress reduction and those kinds of things, um, we try to give them a couple little tips uh, for things that they can add in, you know, that might help a little. And one that we frequently mention is um, alkalizing with either lemon water or a little apple cider vinegar, those kinds of things. Um, and it's confusing because we say, you know, to avoid acid foods yeah. and those seem very acidic. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? I know it's a very complicated chemistry issue, but just kind of the um, simple answer. And this is where, like um, Susan said, you know, having a food guide to look everything up would be helpful. but. Um, it's a really important distinction, something that feels acidic in the mouth versus something that's acid forming in the body. Can you speak it's very, very simple. I'll take, I'll just explain then, Sharon. It's very simple that it's not how the food tastes. The food can taste acidic. It's how the body processes the food. When the body gets done metabolizing the food, does it add free hydrogen or does it add, does it end up as bicarbonate? Turns out the citric acid is metabolized by the body into bicarbonate water. So it's a very alkalizing compound. Okay. Lemon. Are there any concerns when we're alkalizing with things like vinegar and um, lemon water? Um, we hear people are concerned about their tooth enamel and that that's, you know, they shouldn't be having acidic foods in their mouth so much. Um, do you have any recommendations for that, Sharon? Sure, you can you can use a straw, <laughs> and I like to use fun straws. I get the big, fat, colorful straws, and get the crazy straws, and so I recommend straws a lot just for hydration in general because sometimes it's a lot easier to just slurp the water through a straw, and it kind of speaks to your inner child, and it's fun, so I have all sorts of straws, but I think that's a great way to just get what you need in and bypass it actually having contact with your teeth. And what they've also shown is that it's, it's if you rinse your mouth out. So if you, you're drinking sure. this and then you have a glass of water and you rinse it out. What you don't want to do is take like lemon water and then brush your teeth because that will make it a little local acidic situation that could break down. So you want to rinse your mouth out and, or eat other food. And actually the abundant use of saliva is a real healing technique in um, <clears throat> much of the Eastern medicine to generate saliva to, to rinse your mouth out or if you don't want to do that, just take some water. Okay. You know, Excellent. So um, we here, and this will be our last question, but here we talk a lot about um, body pH um, in terms of bone health. And I just wanted to, in case anybody's still on the fence as to whether it's an appropriate choice for them to, to adopt a more alkaline diet, um, what are some of the other conditions or um, results of 
having an acidic state in the body. Well, let me just list a few and then Sharon can come on with her list, but they are because all, all the enzymes, all the proteins are produced in a they need a particular pH, you can get you get you get changes in everything from ATP that you don't produce as much energy in the system to the the vulnerability of the body to fungus and parasites because the pH is off much less to other degenerative diseases. Most interestingly you see increased inflammation and most interestingly tied to bone you see muscle loss because the re alkaline reserves are stored in the bone but also stored in the muscle. So if we get too acid we break down muscle to take out glutamine to make ammonia and ammonia is a very strong buffer and if you've ever taken care of an older person and you maybe notice their urine smells like ammonia that's because they're breaking down their own tissue their own muscle in order to buffer the acids so there are in the book we probably list 50 different impacts um, from everything from inflammation to energy production to ATP capacity to just the ability to be resilient in life. It's it's very interesting. One researcher was looking at back pain and he found that back pain greatly improved. And here's the catch. Here's the thing to remember. If you don't alkalize, that little first morning pH measurement is an indirect measure of pH because the alkalizing compounds are attached to minerals. And so if you're low in alkalizing compounds, you're low in minerals. The alkalizing compounds don't stand alone in nature. They're attached to minerals. And so that is the wonderful measure in every disease related to mineral deficiency, which I dare say is every disease, is going to be related to a pH imbalance. A cheap, inexpensive way, a free way to find out if your diet is adequate. And that's what's fascinating about the Better Bones Builder I developed. Almost everybody alkalizes on it because all those minerals, it's rich in minerals and they all are in alkalizing forms. Sure. Very Sorry, did you have anything to add on to that? No, I was just saying, there you go, that's a great secret. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, ditto to everything Susan said. And, you know, for me, one of the biggest things is I work with a lot of cancer patients. And from all my studies and the work I do in Europe and the clinic I work with in Switzerland, that is one of the biggest things we do for cancer patients is we alkalinize them. We actually inject alkaline agents right into tumors and I do infusions right into the vein that alkalinize the whole body and so and from there we talk about inflammation and so mm -hmm. like I said before any disease any process that's walking in my door I'm always think about thinking about how am I going to get this patient alkalinized because that is the basis of where we're going to set healing up from and so whether it's a skin rash or a chronic respiratory infection or autoimmune or cancer we always want to be thinking about alkalinizing the body and you know in such a destructive disease as cancer I'd say that's you know one of the biggest things we do is we alkalinize to turn the situation around okay. so tons and tons of benefits to maintaining an alkaline diet and um, I mean, if anybody is still kind of questioning or is looking for some more information, we've got some great information on our website, um, womenshealthnetwork.com. We also have, um, Susan has some fantastic articles, really loads of articles on um, betterbones.com. So those are um, some great resources if anyone's looking for more information on an alkaline diet. So um, ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. That was uh, you, we got kind of the science and then kind of the feel good and lots of oh, nutrition. So, <laughs> so thank you so much and um, we will talk with you again soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.